little while ago, Steve and Ann paid a visit to the U.S. Sailboat Show in Annapolis, Maryland. There was some extra footage that never made it into the episode, so in this bonus video, Steve makes booth visits to Seafrost, where you'll see some of the components that will end up inside the new fridge that Steve just finished, and then on to Mantis Anchors to talk about anchor swivels and chain hooks. But first, he'll stop at the clamp tight table to check out their clamping tool. We're just oh. going around and picking some interesting things from okay. the show. And we're wondering if you'd be interested in uh, walking us through this real quick for the channel. I can do that if you guys want. These are pretty cool. They've been around in like some iteration or another for a really long time. Um, but they're really great for emergency repairs. So you want to kind of show us what yeah. you got going on here? Well, let me show you what's going on. So basically what you do is you're making a hose clamp out of wire. Ten times stronger, 90% lighter, a true 360 degree seal, all right? I'm using stainless steel wire. You can use any type of wire, okay? Take it, bring your ends together, make that loop. Feed your ends through the loop. Now, one time through, like this is great for attaching something or banding some things together. Anything you're running pressure, we recommend two times around, so you're gonna go the exact same way, up through the center, through that loop again, just like so. Make sure you're not cross-twisted or overlapped, because water, fuel, air will find a way out if you give it to them. Take the nose of the tool, insert it right up underneath of that loop, wrap it up and around each of those pegs. Twist it together, just like a bread tie. There's a little notch at the bottom of the tool. That loop we made earlier pops right in there. That's your push, this is your pull, and then you just start to turn. So it's not twisting the wires together like safety wire pliers would, so you're not causing that wire to break, because you're not creating that hot spot in the wire. It's also a round wire, you're applying even pressure, so it's not gonna cut into whatever you're working on as well. Really good indication that you're getting tight is the tools telling you it's starting to get hard to turn as well as you can actually see it starting to bite. You could pressurize your system at this point, see if you have a leak. If you do, simply tighten it down until the leak stops. Now, no leaks, you're ready to finish this clamp. If you have the overhead 180 degrees all the way over, majority of the time though, that is really hard to come by. <laughs> so as long as you can get the tool, just past 90 degrees, that's your fulcrum point, that's your lock right there. Take your cutters. Anywhere you can get to the wire on both sides of that tool, that tool out of your way. I'm gonna trim these down. Let me just do this so we're not popping. You wanna make sure you push these down to lock it in place. And that is your finished custom hose clamp. The great thing too is if you need to get that thing back off, bend the tabs back out. That releases it, grab that center, give it a pull, comes right off. <laughs> it's and actually, it. I think, faster and easier than putting on a hose. <laughs> <laughs> Some days it is. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a great tool. Like I said, it works for almost every application that you're using on a boat, car, RV, house. So all yeah, different types of uses. You can use copper wire, stainless you can use, steel, absolutely. Monel, a coat you hanger. Got We've even got coat hanger wire you can go around multiple times if you want to so all different types dock lines ropes it's perfect for that mousing your shekel so this isn't going to vibrate loose once that's on it stays in place so no matter how much that pin's going to be moving on you that's not going anywhere you literally have to pull those tabs back out to get that back off so and you're saying that the Amish use something like this? For the head? I thought that <laughs> that's was pretty interesting. What, that's one of the things that we were we've investigated on. It's like it used to be back in the 1800s. It was a very big wooden version of this that was used for hay bales. So that's what they used. So it's just been the concept that's come down and how we've come out with it. So yeah, gotten a lot more streamlined. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Using it for a lot more applications than on the farm. So. <laughs> Cool. Absolutely. That was pretty neat. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So yesterday we came and checked out the Seafrost, and there's someone here who's actually a lot more knowledgeable about it than I am. So let's get him mic'd up, and uh, we can talk about the Seafrost a little bit. So uh, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Nate Horton with Seafrost. All right. So we have a, a Seafrost unit here. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so this is showcasing the BD series Seafrost systems, which are 12 or 24 volt. 
All right. And they use Danfoss compressors with valve regulation and evaporator plates. They have the option of being air cooled or air and water cooled, controlling the water pump with a relay. Um, there's various thermostats that you can use. There are digital controls, which offer the, I guess, the most control uh, rather than a mechanical control. Um, speed controls that run the variable speed compressors to limit the consumption over time. They're the same BTU per watt at the different speeds. Um, the newer models have an automatic AEO function, which will uh, learn the compressor speed and what's the most efficient. Over here is an example of the evaporator plate. Oh, look at that, you even got a bunch of cold beer. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, this is an example of a holdover plate and the adaption to a trade winds style compressor. Um, this would be used with an engine drive um, and kind of an older, older model. This is the new evaporator plate, direct evaporator. The direct evaporator means that the plate is only going to be cold when the compressor is running. So this has a holdover, and that is a direct evaporator. Nice. Uh, yeah. One of the things that I really like about this, looking at other models, is a lot of the evaporator plates are aluminum, and they're really flimsy. And it seems like with a sailboat, with things moving around and filling up that reefer, that it would be pretty easy to, to damage those. And these stainless steel ones seem a lot more robust. Is there any issues with, you know, cramming things in that fridge and stuff bumping against them, or are they no, the, as robust as they look? The plates are pretty indestructible. We've had people try to put ice picks through them, and they have been unsuccessful. Um, the reason we're able to do that is because of the valve regulation that Seafrost has. They have a constant pressure valve, and they, the Seafrost is really a marine grade system, meaning that all the parts are high quality, they're all component replaceable, and it's not mass produced. So the, the aluminum plates are all stamped, and they have dissimilar metals, and they're uh, economical to make, is the why they do it that way. Yeah. Uh, but the valve regulation has been the most reliable and the most temperature controlled. So that as the condensing environment gets hotter and colder, the pressure and the valve and the plate temperature remain exactly the same. Oh, interesting. Whereas if you have a capillary tube system, your pressure changes with the environment the condenser's in. So it, 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 it makes it more stable and a much more even temperature. And you have other little fun things like uh, cooling fans on brackets that help move circulate the air vertical ice trays that go against the plate, uh, which we don't have here, but um, there's a lot of them out there. Yeah. And, and you guys also make, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but a freezer box that goes into the reefer, right? So you have two of those evaporation plates basically forming a box, and yeah. whatever you put inside it would freeze, right? Exactly. Yeah. Those are freezer bins, and another thing about Seafrost is that everything is fully custom. Uh, we have templates for things that are already done and, and standard sizes, but it's really, you're able to uh, make it fit in spaces where you can't just buy something off the shelf and stick it in. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that you work with Seafrost and the majority, I say every single system, is kind of checked with the company and it doesn't leave until the plan is well developed. Okay. And they really help design the systems as part of the whole sale procedure. Nice. Um, so everyone that doesn't work is a, a real problem for them. <laughs> this is our S1, which is basically our smallest swivel, but it fits a uh, quarter inch uh, transport chain, you know, 70 and grade 40, 516, right? So that's our starting right there. This design was based off of what he saw with other swivels where there was a binding happening when you were going to reset. And so, you, uh, like this model here, you can see where it started to bind right. because they're mostly set to go directly to the anchor. So what Greg did is he put a bow shackle in this to give it articulation in all directions when you're starting to reset. Yeah. And then that swivel is actually down here, away from this setup. So you got nothing in it. It's all streamlined, so it goes over the roller easy. Um, the duplex pin in here is a duplex stainless steel, so it's stronger than the whole assembly. It's oval shaped, so it's got a great holding power. 
I've got the S2 on my 3.8 chain on my catamaran, and I've uh, had good luck with it. They just started putting a pin in here instead of the seizing wire, okay. which is what um, some folks want something uh, they could just do one thing versus we send a seizing wire in it so you can do that and lock that in place. Okay. I'm going to show you this big one here so you can actually see what's inside. So there's this shackle that's holding these two pieces together here. This collar comes off. This is the chain going here. You slide down the chain. There's two pieces here that are holding this. This is where it's spinning, right? And then there's that piece there where the chain is actually going through. Oh, it's very simple. So it's very simple, right? So the chain is in here. Put your link in. Put that on. Slide it up over the chain. Ha ha. In place. Seize it. Put your shackle back together. Through your anchor. You can also the seizing wire here if you want to seize in place, and you're ready to go. Nice. Yeah, really like it. Swivels on anchors, you know, you ask sailors. I, I think there's three camps. There's I would never, I would always, and those people don't know yet. Yeah. So it's like that. I'm, I'm a swivel guy myself. I like the swivel. I like the idea because for me, when I say swivels, people are like, oh, no. It's like if you're only on anchor maybe one or two nights and you're not doing that spin, I'm yeah. really not worried about uh, it. But you can kink that chain up real quick. You can, but if you're at a couple nights and, you know, a week, let's say, you have that potential to kink that chain up, and even though it may unspin as you pull up, you're not getting your full loading ability on there, and you may put a knot in it depending on how they're off. So yeah. if you think you're going to be at anchor for more than a, a, three or four days, yeah. I think a swivel is a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. But anything less than that, no need. Right? And, and then, then chain hooks. Chain hooks all over here. Uh, on your boat, this is going to be <laughs> this one, hopefully, but possibly this one once you've done all the math, you yeah. know, our half inch one. Um, this is also a duplex steel, so it's really strong, right? Made to hold the chain. I don't know if you saw his old chain hook. His old chain was big and square, and it was awesome. It did a great job, but a lot of folks had a hard time manipulating it. Um, and it wouldn't go over the rollers very easy, right? Okay, yeah. um, for some boats. This one, the design's more streamlined. It hooks, it's real easy to hook onto the chain uh, for anyone, obviously, if you go the other way. And in addition, we've got a strap on there for that when there's no wind. When there's no wind and everything goes slack, it will fall off. off. That's the only reason that's there, is to keep it in place when there's no wind. Once it loads up, you know, it's, it's going to grab. Yeah. That's awesome. And you can see braking strength and the size it fits. Comes with the shackle, comes with the strap. This is a new improved strap. This is our third strap. Yeah. We broke a few. Yeah, but. Yeah, and imagine oh. it leads a tough life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this is probably going to be, would be the one for you. Yeah. You're, you're looking at 7 16 half inch chain because we're getting to 30,000 pounds. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and to my understanding, Grand Tackle's not somewhere where you want to skip. Nope, nope, I like my boat in the water, not on the rocks. Yeah, there was one that dragged out here yesterday. Uh, Beneteau slammed into another one. They, they drugged their anchor and did a bunch of damage. When I took the water taxi back, they were out there getting them untangled and sorting it out. You didn't get a chance to see what the anchors were, did you? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> probably a yeah. Delta. <laughs> yeah, probably a Delta. Yeah, well, Benetos do come with those, so, so yeah. you see that a lot. So last thing, um, and that, that system, we got the, uh, we looked at the anchor, we looked at the swivel, and the chain hook is the bridle. Yep. We sell a, a variety of bridles depending on the size of boat and type of boat. Are you on a catamaran that's got um, the attach points like the Fountain Peugeot? Then we've got one with uh, thimbles at those ends that you can attach to it. Yep. Are you a monohull with fleets? Then we have the, the soft ends with loops. Okay. Right? And then all of them have the heavy duty thimble at one end that you can put whatever you want. You're going to put a, our chain hook, uh, someone else's chain hook, a line grabber of some sort, you know, yeah. all those things. And it's full of chafe, so it's really prepared to take an abuse, out of sea. Yeah, I'm leaning towards, um, I've never seen it before other than Dave Gurr's book. I don't know if you're familiar with Dave Gurr at all. Um, but he is a huge proponent of putting what he calls an anchor pennant on the bow of the boat, which seems like a really interesting idea. Um, so basically uh, low on the stem about where um, where the bow sprit chain would come in yeah uh, you put in a really strong anchor point that yep. goes all the way through your stem and then you fix your bridle permanently to that it's just a line but not a bridle yep. and then you put your hook on the end and then when you anchor or more 
you're anchored and moored basically at the water line on the stem of the exactly, boat, and yeah. it doesn't foul the bobstay or anything, doesn't chew up your stem, and then you bring you know the chain or the road up on deck and tie it off like you normally would in case that were to fail. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting idea. And they're saying that when you're you know sitting there in some chop, having that anchor come way up out of the water onto your bow and pulling your bow down as opposed to right there at yep. the water line. So I thought that was a really interesting thing and something that I don't think I've ever actually come across in practice. I had seen it in a couple boats um, and I'm intrigued as well. I'm like, oh, hey, that's a great idea. I like that idea. Um, I think it's one of the reasons the, the Fontaine Peugeot's and stuff are trying to get the anchor under the cross beam instead of under the cross beam. So we're trying to get that anchor point lower in the boat. Yeah, and it reduces there, your pulling. scope as well when you drop down exactly, that yeah. five, so, six feet. The first early boats I saw it in mono holes were just attaching it to the bowsprit, and I'm like, mm, you know, I mean, the, the, the bottom of the bob stick. Yeah. And that is pretty strong, but I don't think it's that strong. So yep. that guy putting an extra point there, yep. perfect. Do yeah, that. that's exactly what we're doing. And yeah, you know, more and more as the more boaters are out there trying stuff. I, I know guys out there that are uh, doing Dyneema soft shackles to their anchor and part of their ground tackle. Oh, okay. And I'm like, oh, I love that. I love Dyneema, but I'm, yeah. not, I'm not ready for that yet. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, they're doing that. We've got more folks out there doing different stuff and trying things. I like that idea of, you know, getting the anchor point lower. Oh, yeah. So, you guys going to be incorporating that into the new boat? Yeah, yeah. So we bought a half inch thick piece of bronze that's about yay deep and about yay long and we have essentially a machine shop so we are gonna cut that to match the shape of the stem and then the boat has uh, custom made bronze floors so that will get through bolted through the six by nine oak stem and through the bronze floors on the inside of the boat so if we were to rip that attachment point out it means that we lost the stem yeah <laughs> lost a lot we lost oh, wow. a lot so robust. that'll have a hole in the top to go up to the bow sprint uh, for that, and then a hole below that for the anchor pendant. At least that's the plan. That's all right. We'll see, we'll see how far we get and if it changes it then, right? Yeah, it's always subject to change. Awesome. All right. cool. Well, thank you. Well, thank you so much for talking with us. Anytime. Enjoy the show. Oh, yeah.